Well, let's, let's take five minutes to, to talk about this paper and uh, see what's going on. I, would, I just wanted to give you this paper because I thought it was a, um, before we talk about that paper, I want to talk about the next paper really because uh, I get, it's a, actually quite a long paper, but it's an interesting paper because it uh, is one of the papers that first developed a, a complete theory for what we'll call cyclic voltammetry. And we'll see cyclic voltammetry coming up very shortly in our um, discussion. So um, what you can look at here is a, a method in which they've actually derived using analytical methods uh, through quite a complicated uh, mathematical derivation, at least for electrochemists anyway. Uh, and this was done quite a while ago, obviously, but um, it, uh, it's kind of interesting. And it also gives you a lot of information about a very popular and useful method called cyclic voltammetry for lots of different cases. And uh, we'll see how we can use these ideas later on and use the theoretic theory that he develops here to help us understand what we're actually seeing in, in chemistry. So we'll talk about that next time. What about the paper of the day, though? That's this one here. I, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because I, it was a paper that I had in my files that did try to correlate something that we talked about last time, which was correlating the relationship between uh, electric kinetics and homogeneous kinetics. And um, again, this was d done a, a, a while back, but what they were doing is essentially taking an ex redox reaction, A plus an electron to A minus, and then an exchange reaction, A plus A minus going to A minus plus A, and hopefully getting an agreement between Marcus theory and um, and uh, their experiment. So what I thought was interesting was essentially on um, table one, you can see there the values of the um, rate constant that they suppose they measured. And those are actually fairly rapid rate constants. So, um, and then also the, the rates of exchange. On page 221, the Marcus relationship that we mentioned before, and you see Z exchange is Z electronic collision frequencies for homogeneous and electrochemical reaction. And they just set them equal to 10 to the 11th and 10 to the fourth centimeter per second. Okay. All right, well, let's start. Let's, let me ask uh, if there's any questions from you guys about anything on this thing. Yeah. How do you calculate the EHAB and the diffusion coefficients? This is supposed to have a big shape, the cyclic number. Well, they don't. They actually didn't use cyclic voltammetry to do these uh, measurements. Yeah, for the the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, they probably um, they probably did it a couple different ways. They uh, they might have actually done some voltammetry, cyclic voltammetry, and measured it that way. They mentioned that at the beginning of the results in the discussion. Oh yeah, they see that. So that's how they would get E one half. They would just measure. Um, we haven't talked about cyclic voltammetry yet, but what you get is a in the cyclic voltammogram is a, a curve that looks something like this. And if the rate is sufficiently rapid, the average of the forward and p reverse peaks is equal to we'll call that E P C and this E P A. And so E one half is uh, equal to EPC plus EPA over two. And so that's, that's probably how they did that. I'm not, they don't really say exactly, but that's what I'm assuming. What are the diffusion coefficients using by equations after this? Yeah. What's the biggest? 
Well, we've seen already today how we could use, a, say, the Cottrell equation to get the diffusion coefficient. You could do a Cottrell step, and knowing concentration and the electrode area, which is we've talked about, but they can make the electrode area pretty close to being the true electrode area with care. They can get the diffusion coefficient. So they either did it that way, or they used the literature values that that you know they may not have done it, and this is the same experiment or something that they could have. Got it from a table of value somewhere too. For, for that cycle of contemporary workload, yeah. What what would be the situation if the number of electrons involved in that process is doubled or tripled instead of one electron became two, three? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> well, it's it's a little complicated, but um, if you look in your book, there's actually an equation at the front cover called the Sand Equation, which states that the current is proportional to n to the three halves, where n is the number of electrons. So in fact, the current does not increase by a factor of two with the two electron wave. It increases by kind of this unusual factor of three halves. And uh, not the case for Cottrell uh, uh, steps. So you see that that directly related to the number of electrons in the current. So. If they didn't know the number of electrons, they could compare the cyclic voltammetry current in the theory and the Cottrell current in the theory and understand because the N is in two different forms, a three to half, three halves form and a, and a, and a, a unity N to the one form, they can actually get the N value that way, for example. Uh, the peak shapes are, um, for, for N equal to two, actually they, they become sharper. closer together, and we'll see that next time. But actually, if you look in this paper here this, that I've handed out, you'll see exactly what that is. And usually what they'll do is they'll scale the, scale the potential scale so that it's, it's divided by n. And so even though it doesn't look any different, the potential scale actually gets compressed as the number of electrons increased. So, it's, so in fact, the average potential Separation between those two peaks is about 60 millivolts for a one electron wave at room temperature. For a two electron wave, it's about 30 millivolts uh, at room temperature. And so, again, that would be another way of saying it. These are only for reversible waves, but by looking at the peak separation, you can get an estimate of the number of electrons. Not a very good one, but an estimate. So almost all the ones that they've shown here, though, are, are one electron processes. The reason why won't they? Why aren't they using two electron? No, just by. Uh, but just, just, just for example, they may know why they wouldn't be using two electron. No, they didn't use two electron. All of these are one electron. Right. Why would they want to use two electron things? Why would they want to? Why you know? Why, even if they wanted to, why would they not use two electron waves? Probably. Do you want to have a chemical? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are they? They're interested in really the fundamentals of electron transfer, right? They're not. So, what's fundamentally going on here? Then, if they have, why would that not be helping them attain the goal of a fundamental understanding by using? a two electron process. We have more than one species, more than two species in many of this case. Electrons is a multi-step process. Right. All right, there's a, that's a multi, there's no such thing as a fundamental two electron, electron transfer. So if we put in two electrons, we have to consider that as those are occurring in two separate processes. And so our, our Marcus theory doesn't really allow us to use two separate processes directly. I mean, the, at least the form that they're using here doesn't. And uh, so that would be a, a perturbation that they really couldn't account for in their, their data. So they're just not having two electron processes. The fundamental thing they're looking at is how they're trying to distinguish between two separate types of theories. One's called the Marcus, the Marcus theory, which we talked about. The other is a theory called the Hush theory, which is very similar. If you look at one and two, you see the only difference really is that 
a factor of uh, square root dependence on the, the self-exchange reactions. And, um, and the difference is how the uh, Hush theory treats the internal rearrangement and, and the solvent re reorganization energies. And that's basically it. And the Hush is basically another parameter added to the theory. And um, of course, as you might be aware of, is every time you add another parameter to any theory, it becomes easier to fit your experimental data to it. So the uh, question is, is it valid to add another th parameter, or should I try to use a minimum number of parameters? And so um, I think it was, what is probably interesting and probably what's happening there in this particular paper is that you notice a, a value of k's centimeters per second in figure one that above, that the, all those points sort of level off at about one, right? And so what's the, probably the most likely effect there, although they won't admit it in their paper, is that they're not able to actually measure any rate faster than one because of the instrument they're using or the method they're analyzing the kinetics is that they're just limited. They have to go to shorter time scales or they have to be more precise to make measurements faster than one centimeter per second and they can't do it. And so all their numbers sort of bang up against that ceiling and they don't see any um, difference. And so that's one of the problems, especially with the mark distinguishing these two theories, one requires fast rate constants to see these effects and they can't actually measure the fast rate constants to distinguish it. And so um, this isn't probably the best paper in the world, but it does illustrate what people are doing when they're trying to measure rate constants and and how they're trying to develop agreements between theory and experiment. It's not so trivial, it's not so trivial an undertaking. But, um, but they did, they get good agreement you see as you see for slow rates and that's, that's what Marcus theory is telling them uh, is that slow rates, it's a good prediction as you'd expect. Well, we better stop here and um, see you next time.